Bad news is back to good news. When the Fed was tackling the fight against inflation, there was a period of time when we looked to soft data as the signal that the Fed was winning the fight against inflation. And today we reverted back to bad news being good news after a cool ISM print sent yields lower and stocks higher in early hours trade. So does that mean what worked in 2023 will work in 2024? And will we get a mega cap resurgence? Today, we're gonna to be talking about the mega caps and their earnings and why they're absolutely still pivotal in this market. We're also going to be talking about the labor market, NFP expectations, and what will bring the volatility. So sit back, relax. We've got a lot to talk about. Let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show, where we talk about stocks in the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit the notification bell, like this video, and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. A very mixed day today. We finished just in the green. We had some weakness here in consumer defensives. People sold utilities, and we're buying stuff like a uh, software, the bigger names, com services as well. Healthcare was very, very mixed. And until we actually get material buying in stuff like defensives, utilities, the market is just giving you dip buying opportunities. But we saw weakness in Nvidia. The market is trying to assess the Taiwan situation. There was an earthquake that went down there. We also saw weakness in Visa, MasterCard, JP Morgan. Microsoft as well. But all in all, a very, very mixed day. Now, the SPY finished ever so slightly higher, up 0.11%. As you can see, uh, software, tech, semis, industrials, mostly just cyclical names and then like miners beat the SPY. And then we had like defensives and like super rate sensitive names, stuff like financials, right? Regionals, healthcare, real estate. They underperformed the SPY. But all in all, it was a positive day when you look at it. Now, the market actually opened red. So, and then we got some data, we bounced, and then we parred a lot of those gains. So we've pretty much finished flat, but price action kind of looked like this. You know, we gapped down, opened red, then we rallied, had some price action at the top, and then, you know, we sort of made our way lower, parred all those losses. And the reason why we actually had a massive bounce had to do with ISM services, uh, simply because prices paid missed and the market rallied. The reason why that was important is because it was services. Services missed in a very big way. If you actually have a look at the ISM composite, right, you have services and goods. Goods is in outright deflation. The services component is what's keeping inflation sticky. So to see this part actually diverge from trend, actually to come in really, really cool. The market did like that. Secondly, Powell affirmed 2024 cuts. We pretty much said they are likely. And then the ADP employment from March showed the biggest jump in private sector hiring. So these two stuff took the market higher, right? And the ADP was the reason why towards the end of the day that the market actually fell you know, because stronger economy situation. But we do have to take into consideration, in my opinion, the ADP employment is just notoriously unreliable. There's literally been like terrible ADP prints, really good non-farm prints. So the one we want to look for is non-farms. And that's the big major data point that's coming up this week, non-farms and then the unemployment situation. But let's actually quickly hop on the chart. Now guys, here's the S&P 500, but have a look at the majors really, really quickly. Look at the NASDAQ, right? Look at the S&P 600. Everything was green, the RSP, mid caps s p 600 iwm but let's actually hop on the five minute chart before anything else so this right here okay you can actually see we gapped down and then actually moved lower uh, on the first five minute candle right and then what we actually saw is a move substantially higher after we got some adp data after we got some ism data right now in the context of the entire week you can see this was the monday to tuesday gap down. So we actually didn't close the gap, but we did rally very, very strongly. And then we actually did par a lot of the gains that we made intraday. Uh, and we got to this low right here where bulls came in a big way, bought the dip, and then we had our zero DTE hedges. Once they rolled off, once those contracts expired, we saw a massive ramp up to close the day pretty much at 52.11. So we did actually close higher than what we opened and what we closed yesterday. Now looking at the daily chart, right? We said that this right here, this 5200, 52.02 level is a line in the sand and it's proving to be a very good line in the sand. I do think if we stay above it, we probably keep making our way higher, buying dips, selling rips. It is the gamma flip zone. If we do make our way below it, expect volatility in negative gamma volatility tends to expand and so dealers will sell into selling and buy into strength and so you get massive erratic movements in negative gamma whereas in positive gamma you get these more compressed you know very sustained movements 
to the upside. That being said, there is a dip right here. And for the most part, you know, we're only looking at a peak to trough drawdown of about 1.58%. So as long as we stay above this 5,200, we find support here. I would continue to look at levels like 5,200, uh, 5,260, sorry, 5,280, maybe 5,300. There's not much more to say from this chart. And I think, you know, if you want to look below the 5,200 level, I would really just look at the first key level of support being this right here. That's the, really the first first key level of support just because uh, the first red day and it was actually the low of this week where we had this massive rally so you know a 5116 I would look at that level right there if we do start to like go down use this resistance and pull back lower but we're not seeing that just yet we did close slightly higher on the day above the 5200 mark and based on the data we, we're getting we're probably just going to make our way higher unless non-farms comes in very very hot and then that could derail everything but I think non-farms is going to come in line that's my personal opinion I have a feeling it's going to come in line based on the ADP numbers we got. But again, very unreliable. But I do think we're going to get non-farm figures in line. And the number we're looking for is 200K. I think if we get like 210, the market should look at that as all right. I think we get anything 220 and above. That's going to be a very hot number. I think anything below 200, anything below 200, but above 100, I think the market's going to be very, very cool uh, with those figures right there. And then we should see a rally for the most part. But yeah, that's that's everything I'm looking at right now. I mean, 5200 is the line in the sand. I do favor higher prices and I'm, I'm just looking at this as a simple dip to be bought. But if we do really make our way lower, look to as low as 5116. You can also look at this level right here, this level right here, 5140, 5180. You know, the major levels we want to look to right now is this level right here. But ideally, we hold this 5200 and continue sustained price action to the upside. Now guys, looking at sentiment, this is Bofa's equity sentiment sell side indicator. And it's pretty much the most recent reading here in March. Very interesting stuff. Now do take into consideration the 15 year average is 54.7. And this indicator, like almost every other sentiment indicator, we look at the fear and greed index, CNN's bull bear indicator, as well as Goldman Sachs sentiment indicator is not in like extreme greed or extreme bullishness. Right, a lot of these indicators are sort of here middle of the road and the same is true right here. We're sitting right at the 15 year average at 15%. So even though the S&P 500 has pretty much gone vertical for the last 20 weeks, you know, for the most part, it's been backed up by fundamentals. And this is something we're seeing in these readings right here. And it's why actually when we do get dips in the market, you do want to buy them at the moment because the fundamentals are aligning well, the economy is looking really, really good. And we just want to ride these indicators to the sell side thresholds. Now let's actually talk about about the fundamentals. This is EPS growth. We're just going to go over it really, really quickly. So we're looking at Q1 growth of 4%. Now do take this with a grain of salt. My data does say 5%. My data provider, uh, Goldman Sachs here have 4%, but I think somewhere in the middle is probably the truest number. But looking at consensus 2024 EPS estimates. Now estimates normally do actually get revised down. Look at the Magnificent 7. And guys, I want to point this out. It says Magnificent 7. It's really just the Magnificent 7 and like Tesla bringing them down and then Apple kind of doing nothing. Apple is not really growing, but they're not really like decreasing on an earnings basis. And this is actually leading the S&P 500 to have earnings go slightly down, but we sort of trothed here in February and we're actually having revisions to the upside. Whereas the rest of the market, the 493 is actually like going down, you know, we're right here at the what 97% mark, you would say closer to 96. So we've had 4% downward revision since the start of September, 2023. We're probably looking at about 2% since January, the start of January. So, you know, a lot of this like upward revisions we're seeing is literally seven stocks out of 500, which is absolutely crazy. Now, because there's such a big component of this index, let's actually dive into each and every single one. So Apple, these are just consensus estimates for each of the Magnificent Seven, what they were seven days ago, 30 days ago, 60 days ago, and current for Q1, Q2, and then 2024, then financial year two is 2025. Apple has actually had a minor decrease in revisions like I told you guys before very very minor nothing significant but we've seen quite a bit of revisions here in the last 7 to 30 days for Q1 and in the last 60 days here for the second quarter looking at Amazon they've actually had very good earnings and 
increase here in Q1 and that's why those earnings are going up. We could see 60 days ago, 75 cents earnings per share. We're looking at 81 and the same is true here for Q2. We've had upward revisions and we could also see the same here for financial year one. Crazy 5% increase and then a 6.4% increase in the last 60 days for 2025. Looking at Microsoft, very similar to Apple. So it looks like the street has sort of got this number right. We've seen minor increases here for Q1, Q2. And I think if anything, we're probably going to see downward revisions for Microsoft just because I think the street has got it right. And normally if you don't see massive revisions, you probably see downward revisions here. But that being said, slight increases. 60 days ago, we were at 281, now sitting at 284 earnings per share. And for the full financial year, we were at 1160, now at 1163. Looking at Tesla, what an absolute bloodbath. Look at this down 15%, 17%, and especially financial year one, financial year two, 12%, 15% downward revisions. Pretty much from $3.41 per share all the way to $3 here in the first financial year. And then $4.67 to $3.93. That's absolutely crazy. Look at the Q1 revisions. Look at the Q2 revisions as well. And that's why Tesla is selling because earnings are not looking that great. Looking at Meta, absolutely stunning. 13% increase here in Q1 in the last 60 days. Absolutely insane. Huge upward revision. Same here in Q2 as well as the financial year one, financial year two. And I do think these will probably go higher as we get closer to the end of 2024, 2025. Google, very similar to Apple and Microsoft, not much changes in revisions to the upside. Actually slight downward revisions here in 2025. Very, very interesting. Uh, that being said, it probably means the street has got their revisions right. And just for the most part, this is still 15% growth year over year for financial year one, just for the record. And I do believe 14% for financial year two, 2025. So even though it is being revised down or ever so slightly up, it is still from a, a plateau that's going to be growth accretive for 2024, 2025. Now looking at Nvidia, and this is absolutely crazy. 60 days ago, $4.46. Now we're sitting at $5.48. And in the last 60 days, the stock price has actually moved a lot. The stock price is up 84% year to date. A lot of those gains did come in February. A lot of those gains did come at the start of March. And that's because we've seen massive upward revisions, 18% Q1, 16% Q2, 19.5, 19.3 for 2024, 2025. Absolutely crazy stuff here from Nvidia. And that's why the stock's rallying because earnings are coming in a lot better than expected, but a lot is going to depend on these Q1 earnings. A lot is riding on it. And if they miss, I mean, we could see some serious sell side just based on Nvidia's earnings. It's got the entire stock market on its shoulders. Now, let's actually talk a bit about AI. Now, according to Goldman Sachs here, their research suggests that AI could be a major driver of labor productivity growth and the AI transition could require a sizable investment cycle. Now, the estimated effects of widespread AI adoption on annual productivity growth is set to increase here for developed markets to 1.5% annually. And we're looking at the global productivity increase of 1.3 percentage points. Now this is based on top of the already forecast productivity figures over the last 10 year period. So we're looking at a sizable increase here in productivity if this AI trend is to materialize in the way people think. At the same time, I just showed you the growth of the largest stocks that'll benefit from AI. This is where we are right now. We're only looking at half a percentage point of GDP spend in the AI investment cycle. What happens when we get to 2.5% or 2% here in 2030 or, or even like 0.7, 0.8% in 2028, 2029, 2027? We could really see these magnificent seven names ramp up. And that's why you need to have AI exposure because once this CapEx cycle really gets going, I know we're just starting to see it with Meta and Microsoft, the bigger boys, but once the rest of the market starts to play catch up, it's going to go bananas. Now, looking at revenue forecast for AI hardware enablers, they've been materially upgraded over the last year. So we're looking at stuff like Apple, Google will benefit from this, Microsoft as well. And you can see Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, we're looking at a $100 billion increase. Now, I don't know what this means for earnings in percentage points, but we definitely see revisions to the upside, particularly in 2025 in Q4. You know, in 2026, 27, expect this number to keep going up. And at the same time, guys, only 5% of companies are formally using generative AI to produce goods and services. Now, for all industries, we're sitting just under 5% right here. So you can definitely see that once the rest of the market really starts to, to find a way to implement AI in a productive 
disruptive manner in a way and in a way that's revenue generative, we're really going to see the ramp up of AI and it could really be the next big thing the same way the internet was, the same way electricity was way, way back. Now, let's switch gears, actually talk about the economy. Now, guys, we got jolts number yesterday. I didn't cover them, but really, really quickly, everything pretty much came in line. Jolts opening was uh, 8.765. So the labor market continues to be tight. The prime month was actually uh, revised to these figures right here. The quits rate came in line. Everything came in line. There was nothing too crazy. Now we got some data here from Apollo. The labor market has rebounded since the Fed turned dovish. So when the Fed started hiking, jobs plentiful, less jobs hard to get was actually going down. In other words, a deterioration in the jobs market. It's the second the Fed pivoted, we've seen a material change in the jobs market in terms of jobs plentiful. And that's a really, really good thing because at the end of the day, if people have jobs, people will keep spending. At the same time, Time, business confidence is rebounding. This is business conditions, three months expectations. You can actually see we've bottomed out here in, in September, December 2022, formed another bottom here in October after the Silicon Bank crisis here in 2023. And we're on the up and up approaching levels not seen since 2021, getting very, very close to these mid late 2021 highs when business confidence was at its absolute peak when the Fed injected $1.5 trillion into the economy. Now, the big data points that we still have to contend with this week is non-farms. It's going to be a big one. It's going to be a volatile one. We've seen volatility in the market leading up to this. And according to the options market, SPX and NDX options are priced in line with historical reactivity to payrolls. That's non-farms. RTY implies a bigger move than it typically experienced. As you can see right here, this is the implied move. RTY is at about a 1.55% implied move to the upside or downside. You can see that the SPX and the NDX are in line with their historical average in the last two years, but well above the average since 2010. So if we are going to see volatility, we're definitely going to see it more in small caps. And I actually saw a stat the other day. I don't know if it's true, but I do believe that small caps account for 66% of the employable workforce that the public market employs. So let's say there's 100 people employed in the public markets, small caps employ 66%. I don't know if that's completely true. I think that's a stat. I might look into that and get back to you guys tomorrow. But if that is true, that is absolutely crazy. Definitely will see volatility. And that's why, you know, rate cuts and payrolls can be an extremely volatile event here for the Russell. Now, guys, let's talk some seasonality. So this is S&P 500 monthly seasonality all years going back to 1928. So we got a huge data set and normally April, very, very positive, 65% of the time high yeah average return 1.3%. So according to this data right here, the weakness we are seeing in April should just be a buying opportunity for outsized returns for the rest of the month. Now, according to presidential election cycle, April actually tends to be kind of negative, 58.3% of the time positive. So, you know, a significant portion close to 42% of the time it's negative and that the average return is negative 0.01%. So pretty much flat for the month. And then May is actually negative as well. So we could just be seeing a negative month that normally occurs here in April. And we could actually see that negativity or this downside extend into May. And we may actually just get that five to 10% pullback that we've all been waiting for in this period right here. However, we do want to buy dips because this June, July, August period in election years is very, very positive. Look at these hit rates, 79.2%, 70.8%, up 3% here in August, 2.66% in July, 1.44% year in June. So we just we want to keep the big picture open. We just want to buy dips in what is a very strong market nonetheless. Now, do take into consideration, guys, that the momentum factor seasonality since 1980 in April normally does return a negative figure. We do know that momentum stocks right now are stuff like semiconductors, technology, some discretionary names, industrials. So if we do pull back, it's going to be a pullback in those names. And there could actually be quite a good dip buying opportunity here for those of you that have missed the train in 2024. Now looking at breadth metrics, now this is stocks above the 50 daily, 100 daily and 200 daily simple moving average. And we can see here that, so we'll call this a short term, medium term, long term, even though the 50 daily moving average is not really a short term, it's more of a midterm indicator. Look at the worst performing sectors, comm services, 59% of stocks above the 50 daily moving average and then real estate 58, healthcare 67%. But these are much better in the 100 day at 73% 
and then again 73 percent above the 200 daily moving average real estate still looking really really weak but this sector is plagued by the fact that rate cuts could be pushed back and there's a lot of weakness in china but almost in every other sector we're seeing stocks above their 50 day 100 day, and 200 day still traveling really really well and you look at these metrics right look at the average 78 percent here 81 percent above the 100 day 79 percent above their 200 day you know breath is still looking really really strong when we start to see these figures get to the 50 percent handle and below particularly the 50 day and the 100 day that's when we can really start to see extended sell side coming to the tape but until that happens you really want to look at any sell side as just a dip buying opportunity until we really do start to see breath metrics especially these longer term breath metrics start to diverge from trend now let's actually look at the core leadership model so this is just a bunch of sentiment indicators summed up into one and we could see that the market right now is in strong leadership in a strong leadership environment particularly above the 200 line you want to be long have a look at these periods right here these long periods where we were in strong leadership above the zero line and we just went on crazy rallies multi-year rallies same is true right here huge rallies and the only time we got disrupted was because of a macro event like covid and then the cost of living crisis right here other than that the second we're in strong leadership you just want to buy dips hold sit through the volatility because higher prices normally ensue now looking at seasonality i showed you guys this a couple of days ago this is april's average seasonal performance this right here is tax day and normally on average we normally get quite the ramp up in april and then after opex we do travel sideways but it does look like seasonality is diverging from trend this month. Looking at crude oil seasonality, everybody's so shocked by the move in crude, but we normally do actually see a ramp up here in April. And normally we do actually go make higher highs, higher lows, and we normally see a 4% return for the month of April. So if crude actually trends higher, that's gonna be good for energy stocks and it's well within seasonality. At the same time, gold sentiment, gold also has a massive ramp up here in early April. Then we do see a high put in around the 10th, 11th, but then we do make a higher low and we then actually go make a higher high and we do normally return 0.8% in gold which is pretty big for gold for the most part so yeah if you know gold rallying oil rallying well within april seasonality but if you've made it up until here thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell guys like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm cheers